My name is Connie Ralph. I work for the health department, have been uh, their emergency planner. Um, started out as the bioterrorism coordinator, which sounds, you know, pretty ominous and mm -hmm. awful. Um, at any rate, so I've been doing that for several years and um, doing a little bit of different uh, stuff now. But uh, we meet frequently in the preparedness community, and we've talked uh, ad nauseum about multiple things. But the thing of it is, is that what we've said is that um, while we know what our plans are, because we do this on a daily basis, and we prepare, and we get things together, and we're very well versed in preparedness as a whole. The community, the, the public that we're actually tasked to serve and to assist, um, sorry, sorry, keep going. Uh, doesn't exactly know our plans and, and really doesn't know all the specifics. And so we, you know, we got to talking about having this town hall meeting and actually saying, you know, well, we need to share this with people so that they really do know what's going on. So the topic that I'm going to be talking about here is the sheltering plan overview. And, and it's just uh, a basic description of, of some of the things that are very important as far as sheltering is concerned. So we're here tonight to share information and get your input as well because it's always important to hear what, what ideas people have um, as far as preparing. Um, we'd like to review and discuss how various agencies participate in the uh, sheltering operation. Um, elicit information from the audience as uh, uh, applicable and as able and describe what agencies can expect and how to prepare. So. Um, what agencies are actually involved in sheltering in Queen Anne's County here? So there are several. We have social services, emergency services, Board of Ed, law enforcement, health department, public works, um, the American Red Cross, and for uh, animal sheltering now, it's not listed on here, is the QAC Animal Shelter League. There are some um, uh, counties that are a little bit further along than we are as far as animal sheltering, but we are working very diligently to get that together. So this uh, emergency support function, or ESF, uh, it, it, number six actually is what the mass care and sheltering falls under. This um, Queen Anne's County Emergency Operations Plan title page that you see there um, is actually a plan that has just been revised by Jim uh, and his crew out at the Emergency uh, Operations Center. It is uh, filled with all these different emergency support functions and again number six is basically mass care and sheltering and deals with what responsibilities each agency um, has during a sheltering operation. So how is the state involved with, with sheltering? Uh, the Department of Human Resources is the lead agency for the state. They train local social service staff as to how to run a shelter. Uh, they support other preparedness and planning activities throughout the state. And during a, um, a disaster, they actually monitor what's happening in the shelters across the state. There is a mechanism that we have in the state called Web EOC where we can communicate with all the other emergency operations centers so that we know what's happening throughout the state and and uh, the state does monitor this from a central point up in at, at MEMA the Maryland Emergency Management Agency is what MEMA stands for by the way so local um, shelter responsibilities for social services. Um, locally here, they are our lead agency and they're responsible for shelter management. They've been trained to open and operate the shelters. They have a representative that sits out at our emergency operations center. And you might be saying, oh, well, what's the emergency operations center? Well, um, each county has this group of people that, that gathers during an emergency event. There are agency uh, and department heads, people who are responsible for being able to allocate the resources for their agency during, during a disaster. For instance, the health department is there, and part of our duty during a disaster is to man uh, the shelters and provide 
uh, nursing support at the shelter. So we have a person also at the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. So um, social services has one as well. Um, they also maintain and use shelter management kits, and they have things like documentation supplies and some basic hygiene supplies in those kits that they bring with them when they come to the shelters. They provide guidance um, at disaster recovery centers after the fact, after uh, a disaster is over. There, um, and you may have seen and heard this on, on the news with FEMA and everything, that they set up areas where people can go and, and come for assistance to, after the disaster. And, and social services also assists during this uh, at those uh, centers. And they can also be available for EMAC deployments. Um, EMAC is the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, and it is a nationwide state-to-state um, -state mutual aid um, system. So they um, are available for that. So we talk in acronyms all the time. Um, so most of the time people don't know what I'm talking about, and it's like, Connie, say words. So, um, so for emergency management, uh, they are actually responsible for the, sh the shelter site selection. What happens before any, any disaster occurs is that there are areas in the or buildings in the county that are scouted out to see um, whether they're appropriate or not, whether they have uh, the uh, right types of things that need to be available at a shelter uh, to take care of people. So DES goes out with uh, other groups of people uh, the Board of Ed is there, um, DPW can be there, we've even had Maryland Defense Force there to just check out the different shelter sites to make sure that they're appropriate. So during a disaster, we like to think that we know, um, you know where it might be, but you know it could change depending on where the disaster hits or, or what happens, you know, I mean, one school may not work out because it may be uh, flooded. Um, EM, EMA also activates the EOC, so they are the actual ones that put out the notification and actually activate the EOC. They brief the supporting agencies on the situation as to what's happening, what, what is uh, likely to occur, and when the actual EOC group gets together and then is sequestered in that room during the uh, disaster. They issue evacuation recommendations to the public, arrange transportation to shelter for those needing assistance, maintain situ uh, situational awareness with the State Emergency Operations Center, and advise the um, State Emergency Operational Center of uh, anticipated needs. Say we would need to have um, uh, certain, uh, what, 100, 100 cots need to be delivered. I guess that's a bad example. But um, we could put that request in to the State Emergency Operations Center and um, say that, you know, Queen Anne's County needs more cots so that those would be hopefully delivered to us in a timely fashion. Uh, the Department of Health, uh, one of our biggest tasks during uh, a, a sheltering situation is to provide nursing care. And we do, ha we do have teams of nurses that go out, stay at the shelter during the entire time that people are there. We do have some um, uh, limited supplies for persons with medical needs. It's not, uh, it's not the most, but we do have some uh, cots that are like medical beds, the head elevates, the foot elevates, and, and so people who have, you know, medical disabilities or something, they're not, um, if they can't get to a, another area to shelter, they can come and we would be able to, to help them out. And then, like the slide says, you know, first aid supplies, some over-the-counter meds, you know, some Benadryl, some anti-diarrheals, nothing hot and heavy, you know. Um, the one thing that we do have that's new uh, that we purchased are some oxygen concentrators, which is a big thing. Uh, during Sandy, we, um, the health department actually borrowed uh, oxygen concentrators from a pharmacy down in, in Dorchester. And when we were working on planning for what supplies we might need, um, we thought, well, wow, it might be a good idea to just, if we can, purchase some of our own. So we do have that capability. If somebody needs uh, low flow oxygen and they don't have enough that they bring with them, then we we're able to use these oxygen concentrators. If you're not familiar with those, they actually pull oxygen out of the ambient air and, and yeah, concentrate. Is that right? Oh, well, see, we can help you out. <laughs> 
and we do have uh, medicine refrigerators as well, uh, two of them. American Red Cross is a service provider at the shelters. In years past, American Red Cross used to be the lead agency. That's kind of shifted away, so little, away and uh, so that, like I said, social services is. But uh, American Red Cross still is a, a very su a big supporting agency. Um, our local chapter is the uh, Red Cross of the Delmarva Peninsula, and they have quite a large area to, uh, to coordinate. The Board of Ed, we also coordinate with the Board of Ed. They help with uh, the opening and maintenance of the shelters. They have been quite generous here in this county as far as helping us out with, with food uh, at the shelters and also with uh, maintenance, you know, cleanup and that sort of thing. So they've been terrific. They're a wonderful partner. Um, they also may be able to provide um, buses for, for transportation needs. Thankfully, and you know, I could knock on wood or for Micah or whatever this is, um, we have been quite fortunate. We haven't had, you know, situations where we've had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that we've had to shelter for days on end, thankfully. Um, but uh, it's not to say that we don't think about that and don't prepare for that. We also have our um, Department of Community Services used to be, and, and part of that is the Area uh, Agency on Aging. They are um, very instrumental. They will contact their clientele that comes to the uh, senior centers and give them a call right before a disaster. Hey, are you okay? Do you have, is there anything you need? Um, and so really um, do help us out a great deal. And uh, again, like it says here, coordinate resources and sheltering needs with, with the partners. So they're invaluable. Then it comes to the Department of Public Works and during a sheltering operation, during a, a, a disaster, wow, they're, they are a, a very strong presence at the table, um, you know, knowing where trees are down, what roads are out, what, you know, power is out, things of that nature. So they're huge. Um, providing advice on road conditions and recommend uh, evacuation routes to shelters, clear parking areas at the shelters. And the other thing that they help us out tremendously, especially with the health department, is they help us to pre-position our equipment at the shelter. So they actually go to our storage unit where we have our equipment and then transport it and help, help get it into the building so that it's ready for when people start coming in. And what would a party be without law enforcement, right? So um, they certainly um, assist tremendously as far as um, security uh, and, and road traffic uh, patterns and that sort of thing helping. Um, they're just uh, obviously a, um, a much needed uh, part of the team. So what can you expect if you have to evacuate your home, if you're, if you're advised to leave your house, grab your stuff and come to a shelter if you have nowhere else to go? Well, it's not a fancy hotel, okay? Your privacy is pretty limited. The space is limited. Um, Red Cross recommends 40 square feet per person um, if, if you can. Now if you think about it, 40 square feet is only 4 feet by 10 feet. So that's your space at a shelter. You have 4 feet by 10 feet, you know, so not, not a lot of space. And that's if um, we have optimal conditions. Less than optimal, short term, they, they recommend 15 square feet. So that's a little three by five space for you, right? So you can curl up on the floor, right? <laughs> so. Bathing facilities are limited, you know, not the greatest. Um, meals, meals are not gourmet. It's uh, sustenance. And so when we tell you to, you know, bring things to a shelter, if you like to have Oreos, bring them with you because they probably won't be at a shelter. Um, it can be loud. Uh, there won't probably be cots enough for everybody. If we had a huge, if we had to shelter, you know, a thousand people, 500 people, we wouldn't likely have enough cots for everybody. So bring a sleeping bag, bring a blanket and a pillow, that kind of fun stuff. And you won't be able to have your pet with you unless it's a service animal. Um, we're working towards 
hopefully having pets at least in the same general vicinity, perhaps in a, an adjacent building or in the same building but in another room. Um, but we're not quite there yet. We're working very diligently on that, but we're not quite there yet with that. So there, are, there has, has to be rules at the shelter because, uh, gosh, it could get ugly. Maybe a day wouldn't be too bad. Maybe two days, okay, wouldn't be so bad. But, you know, if you think about these poor folks that were in shelters after Sandy or Katrina or any one of the really nasty, nasty disasters, you can imagine having your, your 40 square feet or 15 square feet and, um, yeah, it would probably get kind of ugly if there weren't any rules. So, you must sign in before being officially admitted to the facility, and you must sign out if you're going to leave. You're responsible for your own property, including and especially any valuables that you might bring, and it's not suggested that you bring a lot of valuables, of course. Um, no weapons are permitted, and no alcohol is permitted. Likely, um, you know, there would be designated smoking areas, so if you smoke, that's, you know, one of those pariahs that you would be um, <laughs> relegated to a, a, an area outside. Um, parents are responsible for their children's actions, and children should not be left unattended. Noise levels should be kept low at all times, but especially from 11 to 7 a.m. Shelter hopping is not permitted, and imagine that, right? And um, if you're ill, you should notify a staff member. Those are just some examples. We do have specific rules, and they would be posted at our, at our county shelter. So children are not small adults, and you have to take into consideration if you're coming to a shelter with, with kids, and you have, you know, different age ranges, babies, toddlers, you know, elementary, middle, and high school kids. They all have different needs, different wants and stuff, so you have to think about things like formula and diapers and maybe a portable crib. Um, special toys, you know, blankies and that sort of thing, uh, special foods, games, gosh, phones and chargers for the phones, you know, how would people survive without their phones? So, yeah, think about, uh, think about that, that type of backup battery um, stuff. So any other, other planning considerations here, like for persons that have medical needs, um, it's a good idea to write down, if you do have medical needs, you come to a shelter, it would help us, nurses from the, the health department, immeasurably, if you would write down the, the, what your needs are, the description of your needs, and any type of medical information that might help us if, if some, something, God forbid, should happen to you while you're at the shelter, that we would be able to help you. Um, you should gather special equipment that will likely not be available, um, maybe some special eating utensils, incontinence products, some adaptive clothing, bedpans or urinals, um, medication storage. And you want to keep your emergency stuff in a special area so that if you do have to evacuate quickly, you'd be able to pick it up and go. And if you're coming, if you have somebody that has special needs and they're coming to a shelter and they have a caregiver, do all the caregivers know how to operate equipment? So things like that that you wouldn't maybe necessarily ordinarily think about. You have to, you know, it's, it's everything. You have to what if yourself. Um, keep your medications in uh, prescription labeled bottles, eyeglasses, hearing aids, and extra batteries, special foods, yada, 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 lots of stuff. Uh, protective clothing, activity, and familiar comfort items, assistive devices, and a picture for identification. Um, particularly if you have people that have dementias and perhaps would wander away or, you know, have um, increased difficulty being at a shelter that's unfamiliar and, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So older adults uh, with cognitive loss can be easily overwhelmed by the crowding in the shelter. Um, they may become agitated once they're out of their familiar environment. And overstimulation may lead to catastrophic reactions. You know, somebody gets very angry, acting out, fighting, that sort of thing. So these are, are all considerations that, like I say, we what if ourselves to death with, you know. Um, persons that normally have communication deficits will have increased difficulty at a shelter and, and, and understanding exactly what's going on. You'll want to encourage people in that uh, 
with those conditions to maybe drink more fluids and eat regularly so that they don't become dehydrated, that they don't, your blood sugar doesn't bottom out, that, those types of things. Um, and yeah, to find an area that's quiet, that might be easier said than done. Um, but again, with the nursing staff being there, we'll try and, and help as much as we can to get make people comfortable. And watching for wandering is always uh, very important. And, and of course, safety is our main concern. Uh, so that's basically the little rundown on sheltering. And does anybody have anything they're dying to ask? <laughs> Do, um, do you publicize where the shelters are, um, just for like general information, like in any of the documents that you have here? Do you have listed what the, the potential shelters? Potential shelters might be. Um, the question was, do we have our shelters publicized anywhere? And actually, we don't. What we do have is a list of the shelters that is maintained by D Department of Emergency Services. And the, because it could change, depending on where the disaster would be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that information out there too much ahead of time. It would be at the time of the disaster. And then that information would be everywhere. It would be on TV, on the radio, it, it, on the websites, uh, uh, the Facebook pages, Twitter. It'd be, it'd be going everywhere. So we'd get that information out to where the shelter is actually located at the time of the, of the disaster. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you um, suggest people keeping uh, a certain amount of cash stowed away? Um, you know, being that, uh, you know, one of the things that might go down is the electricity uh, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. in a, uh, any kind of a cyber attack. Sure. Um, you know, then that might be the first thing that goes to throw off our economy. Uh, so, anyway. Yeah, okay. The question was, do we advise keeping some cash? And actually, yes. That is one of the things that uh, is on the, you know, Plan 9 uh, list here and, and, and other lists of important things to keep in your preparedness kit. Because, yes, indeed, if the power was out, you wouldn't be able to go to the, you know, the money machine, you know, and get money. So that's one of the things the, that is, um, yeah, actually critical to have uh, because you don't know when the power is going to go back on. Um, like gasoline as well, you know, an emergency, particularly a hurricane, because we know we, we generally have some warning. It's a good idea to, you know, get your gas tanks filled so that you have them ready, um, so that you have gas. Um, so money is another thing. Important documents. Take pictures of your home and of your, the inside of the house, the outside of your house. There are uh, just there's a wealth of things that uh, are information that are in those uh, pamphlets that we have here for you tonight that you should take um, and you know consider doing in the event of. Um, you'll be happy that you you did. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is our uh, saying, uh, when the disaster strikes, it's too late, you know, to prepare. So, yeah. So it's good to have those types of things done and ready. And, you know, the thing of it is, is that, yeah, I've been, you know, saying, you know, telling folks at the health department to do this for the last 10 years, and I'm still telling them, you know, guys, you have to get your kit, you know. <laughs> How many have your kit? And there's a few hands that go on. So... At any rate, it's it's tough. It's tough because we we get a little complacent. Mm -hmm. um, we think, oh, it can't happen here, and um, or it hasn't happened, and so people just uh, fall into a, a rut of complacency, you know. And and then it does happen, and then people are you know caught off guard. So it's best to prepare. <laughs>